Well, we started here and uh, we'll just plan on going for a roll call if you're able to uh, uh, get the captain rolling. Neil Lurie. Present. David Droge. Here. <laughs> Jacques Livingston. Here. Courtney Michelle. Present. Sandra Stewart. Present. Liz Osborne. And Councilmember Pat. Actually, she messaged here. me and said she wouldn't be here. Who? Uh, Liz had messaged. Okay. Sent out a message saying she wouldn't be able to make it. And Joe sent a message that he's not going to make it as well. Okay, sounds good. I see a little warm travel on Courtney Michelle's machine. Hopefully, um, that's just temporary and she's able to uh, join in the conversation here. Um, cool. Well, it's good to see all of you. Why don't we uh, start with our uh, approval of, of the minutes from our September Transportation Advisory Board meeting? Is there a motion to? Then we can have any discussion those minutes. I'll make the motion to approve the minutes from the September board meeting. All right, Jacques, is there a second? Second. Great. And what was that second from Courtney Michelle? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Any comments on uh, uh, the minutes? Yes, yeah, Andy. Um, there was one when I spoke about the accident. Um, of a skateboarder, a person being hit by a car. It wasn't on my street. It was in my neighborhood. And if they needed to know the exact street, I'd be happy to say it, but it wasn't. It was recorded as being on my street and it was not. So okay. it was in my neighborhood, but not on my street. All right. <clears throat> Clarification there. I'll also yeah. add one. one or I guess it was the age of eight minutes. There's a reference to uh, uh, to my comment about the fact that uh, it will have uh, uh, speed limits less than 25 miles. If the transportation uh, team decides it's in our city's best interest in doing so. Um, but in the sentence that says, Amend from 20 miles per hour to five miles per hour. That's actually not how the conversation went. And we're missing a five percent, a five mile per speed limit here in Longmont, but at least want to be able to consider the uh, the 20 mile per hour option. So, uh, Stacy, does that make sense? I see what you're. I see what you're talking about, Neil. This is Tyler. Okay, thanks. we'll get that corrected. Any other comments on the minutes? Okay. So, uh, so what? Any other additional comments before we uh, uh, move forward with that? Hopefully, uh, to be able to incorporate those comments. Jack, are you uh, made them be comfortable with those adjustments? Yes, I am. <laughs> Here, that's all right. <laughs> A thumbs up. All right, or Courtney, since we don't see your video, are you uh, uh, approving the minutes? Yes. All uh, right, sounds good. Are there any closing? All right, I think the uh, we can consider the minutes from September Transportation Advisory Board meeting. Um, 
Great. Uh, any communication from staff today? I don't have anything at this point. Um, I think Phil's on the line as well. Phil, did you have anything? I just want to give folks a heads up. Uh, we could certainly talk about this at the November meeting, but just in case that uh, doesn't happen or um, if it's too close to the time, there is two meetings scheduled for Thursday, November 12th by the by Boulder County. One is a uh, virtual public workshop for County Line East County Line Road that's specific to Longmont, and that starts at 4:30 and goes to 6 o'clock. And they'll obviously be doing that virtually, virtual public workshop, right? Um, and then also, uh, for some reason, just about the same time from 5:30 to 6:30, they're having a virtual public meeting on US 287 corridor from basically north of Longmont down into Broomfield to where it touches uh, or joins up with uh, US 36. So if you're interested in either or both of those, and I know I am, um, I will 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 be going to both meetings. But if you just if you just want to focus on one, that's fine as well. But again, the East County Line Road one starts about 430, but I think it's going to be a uh, public workshops, so I think it's uh, come as you can kind of thing. Uh, the 287, I'm not sure, but it sounds like since it's only an hour, it's probably starts at 5:30 and will last until 6:30 and be full of chock full of information as well. So, just want to let you know those two things before it gets too close on your calendars. Bill, yes, Andy. Will they send us a link, or will you send us a link to tell us how to jump on, um, jump on and hear it? Yeah, I'm going to figure out if they're, I'm sure they're going to try to do some public outreach. So we'll make okay. sure that as they release those links, we'll make sure that you get those okay. as well. Thank you. Great. Any other comments from staff or follow up questions there from advisory board members? All right, hearing none, we'll move forward. Uh, are there any members of the public here who uh, are, are on the call? Okay, we'll keep on marching forward then. Um, I think our, our first item up on the bat is uh, around our crash report. Um, so uh, Tyler, I'll let you take it uh, from there. Neil, thanks, Neil, board. Thank you for your time tonight. Happy to, or good discussion tonight about crashes in Longmont and the train. Um, with me tonight, I've got Caroline Michael, who did a lot of work on this report as well. Uh, Sergeant Eric Lewis is here on the call as well. I think his video wasn't working, but he has ability. We can hear him as well. So he'll he'll have some additional information to or be available to answer some questions and give some perspective from his end at the you know, the next item after we go over the crash report. But uh, just want to let you know who's here and able to talk about this tonight. Um, right into it. So I sent you guys uh, late yesterday evening the, the full crash report. So I don't know if you've had a chance to really look through that and digest it yet, but I'm um, going to kind of run through that and see, talk about some of the statistics and trends we're seeing in here, seeing in Longmont, and then talk about what we're doing, some of the safety projects we're working on and, and next steps for Longmont. So with that, I'm going to share a screen here and let me know in any point you have questions. All right, before I get going, is that showing up for everyone on their screen? Yep. Yep. All right. So this report really covers when we do our crash reports, we're really looking at a statistical analysis of a five year period. A lot of times um, we're looking at five years so that we've got statistical significance. When you have small numbers of crashes, it's hard to really get a significant sample size. So that's the reason we're looking at five year data for this data set. Overall crashes in Longmont 2019, unfortunately, we saw the highest amount of crashes that we've ever seen in Longmont. Our records go back to 1990. Um, 2019 was the highest one we saw. A figure similar to this is in the crash report that I sent you. It goes all the way back to 1990. But one thing I added to this one is, is a chart that shows the vehicle, estimated vehicle miles of travel in Longmont. And I was able to go back as far as 2003 to really plot that data on there to show how 
how people or how many miles are driven on roadways in, in Longmont, you'll notice we've seen, except for recession area, we've seen growth in vehicle miles of travel almost every year. Um, 2008, we saw three or four years of really not much growth. And then since 2012, it's been vehicle miles of travel have increased almost every year. And with that, you'll see crashes of somewhat followed that same path of VMT. So there, there's some correlation to that. I would say that you know, we did see a bit of an uptick in our injury or worse crashes in, in 2019 over 2018. And one of the big areas we saw a big uptick was in our fatal crashes with our, we had six the previous year in 2018 and we had 12 in 2019. And we can talk a little bit more about that later on if you have questions or wanna talk about any of those crashes that happened. There's a little bit of information provided in the crash report on each one, a very brief narrative of those, but we can talk about those if, if needed. This one again, for clarity's sake and visibility's sake on the table, it's more, it shows a smaller data selection than what's in the report. And then also I plotted this one against vehicle miles of travel to show the rate here. So some positive trends, we are seeing population growth in Longmont, we're seeing more vehicle miles of travel almost every year. That said, crash rates and injury or worse crashes are re relatively consistent over the years. We're striving for a downward trend in those crash rates, and so we still have work to do on our end to, to get to that, to get a decreasing trend on these. Where do the crashes happen in Longmont? Approximately 60% of all the crashes in Longmont occur at public street intersections. One of the things that we're not including in this report is any private private property crashes. So anything that would happen in your parking lot, your Safeway, your King Supers parking lots, that's not included in this data set. So really just looking at the public street right away crashes. And of those 60% of crashes at intersections, approximately 68% of them happen at signalized intersections and 32% are at signalized intersections. So um, definitely traffic signals are not always a cure-all. They don't make all crashes go away by any means. One of the big things with traffic signals that you'll see is the severity is what they really reduce. When do crashes happen? Generally in Longmont, and Sergeant Lewis can attest to this as well, he's probably pretty busy in the afternoons. So really from that three to four o'clock hour in the afternoon is, is one of the highest hours, and then five to six. So as people are picking up kids from school and coming home from work are really the two most active hours for crashes we have in Longmont. In terms of day of the week, Fridays are consistently the highest, the day with the most number of crashes, and we've seen the same pattern for, for this five-year period. And when we look at the months, generally December has our highest amount of crashes, and October is the other only month we saw more than a thousand crashes, but Really, the December one has consistently been the highest crash, the highest month of crashes we've seen as well. Some of the statistics we track, DUI crashes, we've seen an increase in DUI crashes every year since 2013. Those DUI crashes include alcohol and other drugs such as marijuana, which was legalized for recreational use in 2014. Medical and asleep, sleep, medical, asleep and fatigue crashes have decreased in each year since 2016. And of these DUI crashes that happened, approximately 42% were in, resulted in an injury or worse, and the majority were males over females. Of those DUI cited drivers, approximately 51% were between the ages of 21 and 39. And one of the surprising statistics in this that stood out to me as I was looking at this data was that about 10% of those crashes were made up of 15 to 20 year olds. So when you really look at the who's driving and percentage of drivers on the road, it's, I don't, unfortunately don't have statistics on license and how many, what the population of each age of driver is, but that's when the DUI 15 to 20 years old seems overrepresentative in proportion to the number of drivers. On the road. Um, 21 to 29 year olds are the ones, the, the category that had the most to sleep at the wheel or fatigue crashes, about 36% of the, all the sleep or fatigue crashes. Next, we'll talk about vulnerable users. Vulnerable users are made up of bicyclists, pedestrians, and motorcycles. We have seen, this is a table plotted crash rate per population. We are seeing good trends overall in pedestrian 
and motorcycle crash rates. We've seen a couple years of decline in the rates in both of those. We are seeing slight increases in the bicycle crash rates over the last three years. Those bicycle crashes in particular, just showing the total numbers, it's hard to kind of, sometimes it may be hard to grasp the total number when you look at the rate. So just looking at the numbers, again, this would reflect that crash rate we are seeing an uptick in the, the overall number of crashes and bicycles each year. The injury bicycle crashes were down slightly in 2019 over 18. And we did have two fatal bike crashes in 2019. Pedestrian crashes, again, we talk about seeing some downward trends. The overall numbers are down. The number of crash, pedestrian crashes are going down. The crash rates have, have gone down. Unfortunately, again, in 2019, we had three fatal pedestrian crashes. When we talk about vulnerable users and why it's so important to, to focus our efforts on them, when we look at the percentage of users on the roadway or of the crashes that we have, a very small percentage of all the crashes are made up of those vulnerable users, the peds, the bike, and the motorcycles. Approximately 95% of the crashes are vehicle-only crashes. That said, the vulnerable users make up approximately 18% of injury crashes, 31% of incapacitated injuries, and 51% of fatal crashes. So that's a big number for the number of crashes that they're involved in. When we look at fatal crash rates so city of Longmont versus other cities in Colorado, Longmont's sort of in the middle of the pack. We're not the best, we're not the worst. We have, we have work to do. I will note there is a discrepancy in the data here. In the 2018, I think you'll see it elsewhere in here that there were eight fatal crashes. The, the reason for that is the source of the data here. This data is pulled from the FARS, the Fatal Accident Reporting System. And I use that data to be consistent amongst all cities. They report six in their database and eight in ours. So just for the purpose of this table, that's the comparison that was used here. Um, with this data, what do we do? How do we use it? Like I said, statistical analysis of all the crashes in Longmont. We use it as a screening tool to help identify where we might have higher than expected or, or high crash locations. At each of these, we do we weight the crashes based on severity. So a, a fender bender, property damage only crash is going to not going to score be weighted as heavily as an injury or a fatal crash. And then we run a handful of equations. And if you have questions about those, Caroline's probably the best to talk about those. But ultimately, we come up with a weighted crash rate to determine what is what has a crash rate over a crash index over one. Anything over one is makes our high crash list in those. When it's an over one crash index, using this as a screening tool, it's really telling us we need to take another look at this intersection. And what is this data telling us? Is there something we need to fix here? And generally we do. And I think we've used this effectively in the past years to, to target some specific improvements. One, for example, well, this in this presentation, it's a, it's a cumbersome table. So I didn't put the whole table in there. The whole table's in the report. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask about any of those. Sixth and Kimbark is one where we did some curb extensions. We changed some crosswalks there a handful of years ago. And it's one that fell. We, we're starting to see the improvement of that. It's it's fallen in its ranking, so it is showing a positive improvement there. Ninth and Deerwood is a an intersection that was a high crash location, and in 2018 we built the traffic signal. And then after we turned it on in 2018, we didn't have any reported crashes in 2019. So that would be another one. A good example of success. Pike and Maine is another one that's been a high crash location for years. We've made some good progress in terms of reducing crashes at that intersection. It's fallen out of the high crash list here. So I think that's you know, a good example of work that can be done when we really target it with some of these screening tools. When we talk about safety projects, what, what are they? What can we do? We have different levels projects we can do. We can do high cost, low cost. A higher cost safety improvement could be something as a, such as a traffic signal or intersection reconstruction or a roundabout. Roundabouts particularly get expensive if it's right away constrained. When you start looking and purchasing right away to do improvements, that's when the costs really start to go up. There can also be a lot of low cost improvements that we look to do, and those are the ones that we definitely take a look at each year and are consistently evaluating for improvements. They could be as simple as signage. 
Ninth and Martin is a location that came out of this process last year as a really as a high crash location. And one of the patterns we saw was northbound vehicles getting hit by eastbound throughs on Ninth Avenue. So we added some signs that addition extended the no parking area on the south side of Ninth West of Martin. And we made that change in in 2020, so it's not going to show up in this data. But since we've made that change, I don't believe we've had any crashes at that intersection since. So. There can be some relatively cost-effective, really low-cost solutions that have a really big benefit, big bang for the buck. Um, some of the I mentioned the ninth and Deerwood traffic signal. That was one we did in 2018. In 2019, we did a handful of additional safety projects. We put a new traffic signal at the intersection of Airport and Pike. Again, that's one that turned on in 2019, so it's going to take a couple of years to really see the impact of that from the crash analysis standpoint. We did a road, what we call a road diet on Sunset Street. We changed that from a four lane to a three lane roadway. We added bike lanes to provide better multimodal facilities, better easier pedestrian crossings and reduce the potential for crash. When we had the previous, the four lane section, the two lanes in each direction, you have some sort of some indeterminacy from drivers on, are they turning right? Are they turning left? That can lead to additional lane changing and cause and crashes. 2019, we also did our enhanced multi-use corridor project on Mountain View from Hover, or excuse me, from Main Street to Pace. And one of the one of the elements of that you'll see on the photo here is this mid-block crossing. So we had the mid-block crossing over by Skyline High School. We added the uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacon, which is the pedestrian activated flasher when we cross. Those are some of the safety improvements that we completed in 2019. 2020 has been a busy year as well for traffic safety projects where we installed a traffic signal at the intersection of Mountain View and Alpine, which is an intersection that's been at the top of the high crash list for a number of years. So it's excited to get that one turned on and see how that improves that intersection. I think we've heard generally good feedback on that one, both from public calling in and from the from the school district nearby, I think they've seen an improvement in safety for the kids crossing there. Pike and Main is still under construction as part of ongoing safety improvements at that intersection. We Main and Grand has been a high crash location for a number of years. We worked with CDOT to restrict some access, restrict access at that intersection, and I think we're seeing improvements there. Similar project was at 17th and Main to restrict access instead of full movement. At the businesses right close to the intersection. Now they're right in, right out accesses, and it's really reducing the conflicts that we're seeing there. 2021, we still we have more safety projects in the pike. Um, working with Caroline, Caroline put together a good application for HSIP Highway Safety Improvement Program. Some federal dollars that's passed through CDOT to us. We we turn in an application requesting. A little over eight hundred thousand dollars to improve some left turn operation, increase um, to improve. Generally, we're looking to add either or protected permissive or protected arrows, improve visibility of a lot of signal heads throughout town. So, pretty excited to to get that project going. This grant, uh, we got eight hundred thousand dollars. Our required match is ten percent, so pretty good return on the dollar on that one. Ninth Avenue is a project we're looking at. Ninth Avenue from Hover to Kaufman is a project we're looking at in 2020, and the intent for that is there's sections of that that are four lane um, with no turn lanes. And when you walk the section, particularly from Francis to Bowen Street, the road feels really tight there. The sidewalk is a four to five foot sidewalk right up against the travel lane. So being able to take that down to a three lane road with a center turn lane, one lane each direction, and then add the bike lanes through there will really help that section of roadway, I think, in terms of both operation and feel for both pedestrians and bicyclists through there. And Pratt and Sunset is another one that continues. Phil may have some more to add on this. We are applying for some, applying for funding at the intersection of Kim Pratt and Sunset to continue that road diet that I mentioned earlier on Sunset. So we'd carry that three lane section through the intersection of Kim Pratt and Sunset up to Nelson and then be able to add left turn lanes there. That's been one uh, consistent frustration I've heard over the years from drivers is 
the both the north and southbound left turns. Their south northbound and southbound approaches are two lanes. There's no dedicated turn lane, so being able to add those turn lanes will help the operation and safety of that intersection. I want to talk a little bit more about some of the things we're doing at Signals, kind of some of the lower cost solutions for safety that we're to, that we're doing. One of the big changes we've made over the last handful of years is our improving our detection. I think historically we'd use loops in pavement loops to rely on detecting if there's a vehicle there. I think bicyclists have a hard time being detected on those reliably. So in switching to these the thermal cameras, you can see an image there on the screen. They really do a better job of detecting pedestrians and bicyclists. They've been really effective in that. One feature we're using at Signals, mostly on Main Street, you'll see there's a handful of other intersections throughout town, is the leading pedestrian interval. So if you're trying to cross Main Street at 5th or 6th or Long's Peak, you push the ped walk button across Main Street, you'll notice that the walk light comes on before the green light for the side street. And that's really the intent of that is to get the pedestrians walking where they're established in the crosswalk and visible. So if you're on the side street trying to turn onto Main Street in a vehicle, generally you're, if you're trying to turn right, you're looking to the left to see if there's a gap to go. And that can be a common source of crashes is not noticing that there's a pedestrian that's stepped out off of the curb walk. So it has been an effective tool in reducing some of those pedestrian conflicts by getting the pedestrian out there where they're visible and more likely to be seen by drivers. We've also implemented what we call the head protect at a handful of intersections. When I say ped protect, I think that's something we talked about at a previous TAB mem a previous TAB, one of the members asked about is it possible to change the operation of the left turns if there's peds there or not? And we looked into it and, and there is, and we're doing that at a handful of locations. So if if there's a left turn where it can be a flashing yellow, it can go what we call protected permissive. You can turn on a green arrow or a flashing yellow arrow. If a pedestrian is there and pushes the button, they they'll be the walk won't come on until there's a red arrow. So it works as a protected only left turn during that phase. And that's been effective in reducing some of the left turn conflicts we've seen at higher pedestrian uh, volume intersections. We also have where we can, we do what we call the floating walk. A lot of you are probably familiar with that. That's where the walk indication comes on without any user input. You don't have to push a button, the walk just comes on. Um, we've had it in the past, particularly on Main Street, running parallel to Main, so if you're crossing the avenues, walking north or south, particularly in the downtown area, the walk lights will come on without pushing a button, so that's something we've been able to, to get back. We went through a period where we didn't have that after we implemented the adaptive signal system, but we've been consistently working on that to bring that back, and it's something that we've been able to do this year. And then just kind of wrapping up and kind of an early look on on 2020, man, this has been a this has been a year for the books, and it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out in terms of a lot of vehicle miles of travel crashes. I've got a graph up here showing traffic volume on Main Street, and we're looking at from early March, we're seeing about 25,000 vehicles a day on Main Street per day. As we started seeing cases of COVID in in Colorado, and as various restrictions were put into place. We saw those volumes drop pretty dramatically. Uh, about the second week in April, it was about, about 15, 13,000 cars a day for a seven day average compared to about 25,000 prior. As restrictions ease, we saw volumes creep back up and they've sort of leveled off, but still haven't quite reached the peak they were before. So I think we've seen more change in this year than we have in pre previous 50 years in terms of travel demand management. I think it's really had a change on how people go to work. And one of the big things we're seeing is that not necessarily volumes are still down drastically. We're really seeing a shift in the peaks. The AM peak hour doesn't appear to be quite as high as it was before. In fact, it's not really looking like a peak anymore. Our daily volume profiles generally build throughout the day. The PM is still a peak, but we're seeing in more cases that the noon is the higher hour or busier hour than the AM peak. So. Interesting to see how some of those trends shake out. I think that crashes have been lower, and Eric, you probably have more hands on with this for 2020, but I think that we're seeing, we, we saw fewer crashes year over year. I don't have the numbers at this point, but I think I've heard that crashes were down in 2020 over 2019. So 
once we get to the end of the year, we'll be able to confirm that. Interesting to see where this year goes. And with that, does anyone have any more questions, discussion? Yeah, not at this point. Thanks, Tyler. Questions, comments, reports? Yeah, David? I have a couple of them. Um, and maybe you can just address, I'll just spin them out and you just address them as you, as you like. Um, first off that, and I know that you don't have a lot of data for this year, or maybe none really, but I'm wondering first whether that's the step that on the slide we just saw starting in July, or that, was that due to the narrowing of Maine? That's the first question. The second is, is have we had any idea as to whether uh, there's been a measurable increase in accidents during the period that these uh, narrowing has happened. Um, the other two are related to 119 in Maine. Um, so I don't recall when we finished uh, that uh, intersection, but I'm wondering if, if the data that we're looking at with this high composite crash index for that intersection, whether that contains pretty much uh, is that mostly since the, that intersection construction was finished? Um, and then the third thing is is just south of that intersection where Grand comes out. That that particular uh, road is it's only it only looks like it's maybe two blocks long, and I'm just wondering why why is there so much problem with Grand? in Maine. Does that have anything to do with the intersection there at 119 in Maine? That's kind of all of my questions all at once. Sure. So it's so a good catch on the July on that the graph that's up here right now. Absolutely. This is you'll see are you seeing the mouse move on the screen there? Yeah. So so yeah, right here, this is when we started closing lanes on Main Street, third to six for the uh, to provide that extra space for businesses downtown. Absolutely. That is exactly what, what you're seeing right there. We did artificially cap that daily volume from, from what we were doing further south. So good catch. And that's exactly what happened there. You know, right now we still have portions of a lane closed, one half of a block northbound and southbound. I haven't, let's see, I don't think I have. I'll look and see what the newer data looks like on that, but I suspect it's probably similar still. And then we'll see this probably come back, start to creep back up once all those lane closures are opened up. Um, question of measure, is there a measurable increase in crashes on Main Street from the closure? I don't frankly have a good sense on that, Eric. I don't know if you guys, if you may be able to chime in on that, if you've responded to more or less crashes on Main Street. I've, I've definitely seen a couple of crash reports come up in that section, but I don't recall it being, I don't recall it standing out as we have a major problem here. And I think that's something that will be good to look at as we move forward, because when you look at the segment, the non-intersection high crash locations on this, we see those downtown sections consistently being high crash locations. Generally, they're related to either side street parking adjacent to the travel lane or stopping in the lanes for someone parking or buses stopping in the lane is really a lot of the crashes we're seeing in those segments is some of that side friction that's going on being a causal factor in some of those crashes. So. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Tyler. This is Eric Lewis, everybody. Um, what I can talk about on, as far as Main Street and crashes right now, there's not a lot of statistical data to show there was an increase in the number of crashes with the narrowing of, of the roadway. Um, I know that was one of the concerns that everybody had when, when that went in. Uh, more of the complaints that, that my office received as a result of that was the traffic diverting itself uh, to the neighborhood roads to bypass the narrowing of the road, if you will. I didn't really see that that was a, a huge issue as far as crash data or crash rate went. I didn't see that it increased uh, that at all. Um, back to your other question, I think the first one, as far as the main street and 119, uh, why that's a high crash index, Tyler, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's probably the busiest intersection as far as vehicle miles traveled that we have in the city. So um, it is. I don't really have a good answer as to why other than 
percentage wise, that's the intersection where most cars travel through on a daily basis. So, yeah, we, we our last round of improvements at that intersection was completed in 2015. So, unfortunately, the data we're seeing here is four years of post our last project at that intersection. It's about a half a year prior, but. It, um, I think they're primarily rear end crashes and I want to have some more information on the type of crashes at that intersection. But Eric's right, it is our busiest intersection in town and then we do unfortunately continue to see a lot of crashes there. I'm gonna talk about Main and Grand real quick and then Caroline, maybe you have some more information on Penn Pratt and Main. But Main and Grand, what we were seeing there with those accesses on Grand, right? It's access to a couple of car dealers and, and you would think it doesn't go to a whole lot what we would often see for the crashes is a vehicle trying to make a southbound left, two lanes of northbound traffic waiting at the light at Main Street, Ken Pratt would leave a gap for that vehicle to go through and then more or less wave, wave a driver through. That driver would start their left turn and then get smacked and they wouldn't be able to see that third lane coming, the outside lane that leads into the right northbound right turn at Ken Pratt. So that was a very consistent pattern and, and happened on a relatively regular basis and not necessarily that they're being waved through, but drivers were taking a chance. They would see a gap and they would drive through and not see that third one. So that was a, a consistent pattern that the median addresses. Oh, so um, looking, I have it up, kind of looking at it side by side compared to the last crash report that 2014 through 2018, um, there has been, um, so that overall composite crash index has actually gone down a little bit. So it was 3.28 on the last report, and now it is 3.19. And also that total number has gone down slightly. So it was, um, the previous five-year total was 302, and the new five-year total is 290. And then um, most of them, a pretty high number of them are property damage only, which does tell me um, a lot of those are probably rear ends. Um, I don't have the exact number on the top of my head. But... And David, we can provide some more information on that specific if you'd like it. Uh, we can follow up with an email or talk about it at a later meeting, whatever you prefer. Um, I think the only thing would be just um, are there plans to do anything, or are we going to just are we going to chalk it up to, to high volume, or are there some things that can be done to improve? I think a couple of things. One, we need to look a little bit more about those crash patterns and what we're what we're seeing with what type of crashes they are, so that we're looking at the right fix. I think in addition to that, we need to really look at our partnerships with SUDA. That's a big lift for Longmont to look at fixing that all, all in one. So I think we'd probably look to our regional partners to help try and provide some type of solution there. I think uh, Ken Bratt and Hover is another one that's on that list and we're working, we are working actively with our regional partners on looking for improvements at that intersection. So I think it's a continuation of those efforts. Thank you. That's all I have. Great. Other questions or clear, clear questions or comments for folks? Yeah. Um, and hey, and that was actually a good segue, uh, Tyler, because I was going to ask in looking at the high volume intersections where the crash index is the highest, five out of the top seven seem to be focused on the angle of. Ken Pratt and Maine over to Hover and Nelson, Hover and 119. And it just seems like that triangle right there is getting a lot of attention on this table. And so I was kind of curious, is it getting the attention of CDOT and some of our other partners that this might be a high volume area that we need to look at? Absolutely. And for, for that triangle in particular, I don't know if you remember, we started, we called the, the triangles it wasn't triangle study, but the, the Southwest corridors, Southwest corridor plan. And it really looked at the, the triangle 
bracketed by those intersections, Hover and Nelson, Ken Pratt and Nelson, Ken Pratt and Hover. And we, we did look at design alternatives for all of those. I think we've got design progressing on each corridor in there. We're working on design of um, improvements on Ken Pratt that would extend what we did in 2015 at South Pratt Parkway all the way over to Nelson. We're additionally looking at, I mentioned the regional improvements we're working with our partners on to try and find funding for improvements at Ken Pratt and Hover. And then we also have a design project underway on our CIP for continuing design of improvements all along that Hover Street corridor from Ken Pratt and Hover all the way up to Nelson and Hover. So we are actively working on those. They are not, they're not cost variety improvements. So they're in the high cost segment. So it definitely is something that we're working into our CIP. Hey, just That's great, thank you. Uh, just a quick clarification on that, Tyler. Um, for that 119 in uh, Main Street section, it seems like that's the only one that I can think of that doesn't have, you know, some of, of the major intersections that doesn't have some sort of design, major design features that are uh, uh, in the in the works. Is that is that indeed right? Like I know that we have obviously the uh, the major opportunity over on, um, you know, Ken Pratt and and, and Hover that we're, you know, hopefully going to get some federal funding at some point for that or state funding. Um, but is is there is there a larger design study that's taking place around opportunities to improve the the safety and efficiency of of uh, one nineteen and Maine? So Phil, Phil may have something to add here in terms of some of the BRT work that's going on. That might right now I don't know we have any design projects specifically target city design projects specifically targeting this intersection. Yeah, Tyler, I agree with you that, uh, you know, really what we're looking for is to try to re reduce some of the traffic on that corridor that's going to Boulder through putting them, uh, putting people who, uh, who, you know, who would like to, or who, who will want to, because it's more convenient, travel by bus to Boulder. And so we're really trying to make it more comfortable, more convenient, more reliable for that bus travel to, to uh, Boulder. And even uh, on 287, that, meet, that meeting that's coming up in November, that's really about bus rapid transit, uh, you know, straight down 287 through that through that very intersection that you're talking about, and getting uh, getting people directly into Broomfield or even closer to Denver, downtown Denver, on that corridor. So, I think that's what we're trying to do. And then um, Tyler mentioned it a little earlier, but we're also working on some federal funds, some state funds as well for. Um, Sunset and 119, and really trying to make that skewed intersection a little safer for bicyclists crossing. You, you, you Tyler mentioned the Sunset Road Diet, and that would extend that road diet across this intersection. So there's a bunch of different projects that are going on, and they all kind of have different, different look and feel to each one of them. I mean, we talked about the 119 and Hover as well, and that's a, a really large $26 million project, you know, that. We were unfortunately not able to get federal funding this year, but we're going to try again next year. So um, stay tuned on that one. But yeah, these all kind of work in, in concert with each other. So we're working on trying to get a bunch of different projects that solve a bunch of different things along that corridor. Do you think that speed is a factor for that particular inter intersection at, at uh, Maine and, and Ken Pratt? Or, or do you think that's, or, or Caroline, uh, just from, from your looking at the, the data, um, or or do you think that it appears to be something else that's going on at that particular intersection. So Neil, I, th I think we can provide some additional follow-up for that, but I think what we're primarily seeing are rear ends due to congestion. And say for sure, I don't know that those are speed-related crashes. I think they're congestion and inattentiveness that's going on there. Awesome. Other comments? One last one. I noticed, um, and I think you mentioned this, Tyler, that our fatalities, the number of fatalities in 2019 went up. In fact, it doubled. I'm comparing it to the other cities in this cohort. And out of what do we have here, 10 or so, there's only two out of the 10 that actually have similar fatalities, and that's Pueblo and Lakewood. Um, this seems to really jump out at me. And I'm just wondering, do we know 
why the increase or what the main cause of that is? So I think there there is a brief description of each crash in in the back of the report there that you'll see. Uh, Eric may have some additional information to provide. I think there are a couple definitely that um, had some unusual circumstances that led to them, but I think that's, you, know, you could probably say the same for almost every fatal crash. Um, you know, yeah. Lisa. Go ahead. Yeah, this is Eric Lewis again. Uh, we were uh, trying to do a comparison or a cause effect thing. Um, there really wasn't a bright line answer to that. All of these uh, incidences were fairly unique. There were some similarities in that a few of these, as you'll see in the in the uh, description, involve impairment. Uh, a couple involve speed, and then distracted driving, which is. Uh, statistically speaking, nationwide, those are generally top contributing factors for fatality type crashes. So, um, it is unfortunate that, that last year was the the highest number of year that I can remember um, in Longmont. Um, but we're knock on wood on it on not at near that rate this year. So right now we're at we're at two fatality crashes with uh, three total fatalities for 2020. All right, well, that's encouraging. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> it makes me feel a little bit better. Um, yeah, and I guess we'll just watch it and see and see what the future shows us. Thank you. Thanks, other clarifying questions or, or comments? All right, well, thank you, Tyler, and thank you, Caroline, for being able to pull all that data together. I know it's a ton of work putting that together, but it's really helpful. It's um, remarkable how consistent it is for, uh, you know, year over year, uh, despite that one disturbing, very disturbing, uh, uh, you know, increase in, in number of uh, traffic fatalities. Uh, but hopefully that becomes a blip and, and gets back to a, a more normal range. Um, Great. From a traffic safety perspective, uh, 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 Sergeant Lewis, was there uh, were there some additional comments you were uh, hoping to be able to add in today's meeting? I was here more to help answer any questions that people might have. I I think Tyler and I were going to talk that uh, in December I'd like to do a, a traffic safety uh, presentation for everybody, but right now I just didn't have the the uh, IT capability in order to present that. So I wanted to wait till I could set that out a little bit more. So the plan is to do a traffic safety presentation for the for the board in December. Okay. Eric, any other closing comments on, on I realize we're just getting this report out here. Not a whole lot of time to digest it, but any any tidbits or thoughts or anything you've noticed on patrol? I think I've definitely Heard, heard concerns come up from from your end and from other officers, and I think we've been responding to a lot of those for for the better. And some examples of those, I think, um, Ken Pratt and Emory was one that was a high crash location with left turners, eastbound left turners, consistently getting in crashes with westbound throughs. Um, definitely saw that pattern. Talked with Sergeant Lewis about it and made a change to a protected only there, and that's really eliminated the crashes there. Similar Ken Pratt and Martin, similar discussion, similar pattern there. And then a matter of fact, tomorrow third and third and pace is one that we see on this list as a high crash location. And it's one we continue to see the eastbound left turners getting hit by westbound throughs. And I've talked to Sergeant Lewis and other other officers about this. And so tomorrow we'll have a we've got a crew out there to change the signal head out there and we'll be changing that one to a protected only. That should mitigate a lot of the crashes there as well. So I think the you know, we're working together and hearing the what what the offices or officers are seeing and hearing in the field and then being able to communicate that and work well with the PD has been been productive for us. Second that uh, I believe Tyler and I have a really good open line of communication with each other and um, try and make decisions based on facts and not knee-jerk reactions. Um, 
I think the first protected left that I can recall that really made a, a, a drastic improvement was at Pike in South Maine. Uh, it was almost overnight when when that change went into effect, it, the crash rate went down quite a bit. Uh, the other one that I remember uh, most recently within the last three years was Kim Pratt and Martin. And that was more for eastbound to northbound left turners, turn left in front of westbound traffic was a pretty much weekly occurrence. And then um, after that bad crash we had in 2017, uh, after that change, that the crash rate there, at least for bad crashes, is significantly reduced. And so we're hoping that the same will, will hold true for third and pace. And there's a couple other projects that Tyler and I are talking about as far as signalization goes, but hopefully with this grant money, we can look into that in 2021 and see where that goes. Sounds good. Hi, uh, Tyler, I want to, I want to kick highway 19 and Maine one more time. Um, so I was looking, I'm looking at the uh, daily volume. Uh, comparison between that particular intersection and the other ones below it. Um, over at Highway 119 and all those below that on the list, I've got 60,000 cars per day or less. So the, the Highway 119 in Maine has 10,000 more. So it goes from 60,000 to 70,000. And yet the number of accidents goes up by 50%. So it has, it has about 10% more, uh, not quite 10, maybe 12%, 12 15% more cars, but it has 50% more accidents. Um, but it seems like we might want to look at some, I don't know, I don't know, what's just to see what, uh, whether there's some things that we can do to, uh, yeah, I hear that down. Definitely appreciate the feedback, and we will look into that a little bit more and, and try to provide some more information on that one in particular. Sounds good. You're muted. You're muted. All right, let's try that again. Thank you. Um, uh, Tyler, one of the things that was helpful, I think about a year and a half or so uh, ago, uh, you were able to provide some good background context on the different vision statements between uh, uh, CDOTs uh, moving towards zero deaths uh, that city of Longmont has adopted and um, the vision zero that I, I think some of our neighboring communities uh, have participated in there. Do you mind just giving just a quick little kind of 30 second reminder in terms of kind of how, how the two of those work or don't work uh, together and, and, and just the backstory in that, just because I know that the topics come up um, in, in recent months. Sure. So a little bit of that, I think the the goal of both Vision Zero moving towards zero death in the city of Longmont is, is all the same. Where we're striving for that zero zero deaths on our roadways. That is our absolutely our goal. I think that when we looked at and we took this to we talked Vision Zero with our council at the retreat last year. And I think one of the things we talked about was that much of what Vision Zero could potentially entail some additional programs, additional staff resources and cost with that. I think that the work we're doing already largely entails Vision Zero goals and intents, and I think we're working towards that. Um, I think the only thing is um, the biggest difference in them is maybe Vision Zero has a more, um, probably some more public outreach involved with it, which is definitely something that we could look at doing, but I think it has probably a bigger aspect of public outreach and engagement. Great, thanks. So two parallel efforts, they're both important and uh, um, great that we're at least marching on, on one of those there towards our goal. Mm -hmm. 
Awesome, great. Well, why don't we march forward to uh, comments for um, uh, from board members, and uh, we can see what's top of mind from different folks. I'll just go in terms of the order uh, right here on my screen, and and uh, we'll uh, start with you, David, and uh, uh, we'll uh, go to uh, Jacques uh, uh, after that. Uh, yes. Well, thank you, Tyler and team, for uh, putting this together. I. I can't imagine. I know that these tables go on and on beyond what we're seeing on our screen. And uh, so just being able to compile that into something that uh, we can look at and at least think that we can see the trends uh, is a is a commendable. And I appreciate that. And, uh, happy with all the work that you, your, you and your team are doing. So thank you for this. All right. Well said. Chuck? Yeah, I'll uh, go ahead and echo that. Uh, I mean, this is an amazing amount of work. And so I know we have a lot of uh, dedicated, smart people, uh, smarter than me, as far as this stuff goes. And so I really appreciate the fact that we have that capability here. And, and this is great to, to digest. Um, you know, I, there's a couple of intersections that I see in kind of my day to day travels. Uh, one that I just wanted to draw some attention to as my kind of thought is the Clover Basin Drive and Dry Creek Drive. It's on the class two table about two thirds of the way down. Uh, I've been seeing it, this is the one that's kind of like behind Coles over there and that intersection right there. And it, it almost seems like an obvious place for some improvements. And the volume seems to be just increasing uh, twofold, threefold. I don't know what the data is showing on that intersection, but I would be curious uh, because here the volume doesn't look too high, but I think it's something worth keeping an eye on. Um, you know, it kind of gets blended into that triangle that I was talking about earlier, where this is a very high volume area. And so when I think forward, I think of where those growth potential places are gonna be. And this is one of the ones that stands out to me. Um, and then I think my other thoughts on it is, I don't know what our revenue is gonna look like over the next few years. And so I'm very happy to hear about all these partnerships that we have with the state and you know with the federal authorities to try to bring in as many dollars as possible, use our leverage, use our great data that we have to try to get the best leverage we can from our partners and to bring more dollars into the city. Um, Longmont is a, a beautiful city that's growing by leaps and bounds, and that's gonna mean more cars and uh, more data. How about that? So, uh, th thank you for all the hard work. If I could real quick, Jock, the Clover Basin and Dry Creek is an intersection that is on the radar. When we're looking at our CIP, for next year and we look at where traffic signals may have a need and where they may end up be, being we've got a handful kind of a top five category and that that is one that's on the radar that's it could be one of about three or four intersections where we're, we need a signal next and that's one that's on there that we're watching on a regular basis for first mountain view and alpine and now that one, you're, you're just right there with me tyler <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. Uh, Courtney, why don't we turn to you next there and see if you have any comments or questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. Thanks for all the great work on all this data. It's very interesting to see, and I know a lot goes into it. And I'm glad that there that the feedback uh, used or uh, spoken uh, makes an impact. So um, I had a couple of questions just about Pike and Maine. I was there the other day and it seemed, now I didn't see this because it was the opposite way of going, but it seemed that the northbound uh, traffic going west on Pike got two left arrows as I was sitting waiting to go south. So I'm wondering if that timing is still being worked on with the new intersection. And um, also in general, how do people, um, report things they might see like some crumbling concrete on a on a median or a few little lights that are out on one of the stoplights or something. Is there a feedback loop for that kind of thing? Like 
people tell me a lot of things that they see because they know I'm on the transportation board. And so where should I direct them to fill out a form if they see something that's wrong or needs to be paid attention to? Thank you. So service works would be the best place for those comments. It's online. Um, and I can share a link in the chat or email to everyone as well for where that re reporting system is. It's probably the best source for all of those. Um, in terms of Pike and Main, I'll have to take a look at that. I know that there may not still be in the final alignment there, but in terms of the potentially serving two lefts, it is it is an intersection that's running ad adaptive, and depending on who's at the intersection, it could potentially do that based on demand. Great, thanks. Sandy, any thoughts on your side? Yeah, thank you. A um, couple things. Uh, I do really appreciate the report, uh, crash report. Um, I wanted to know, um, someone had reported that they thought maybe we'd only had two fatalities in 2020, and it seems to me is 119 and County Line Road, um, is that part of Longmont? Because there was just two fatalities recently there, and then Oxford in 119 towards Niwa, two people were just killed there over the weekend. So they're all both on the east and west side of town, but are they going to be included in our crash report next year? So that's one of my questions. And secondly, I I'm very in tune with this vision zero, so I'm happy to hear that we are still concerned about that. I had read in in your report that uh, you had um, we had partnered with CDOT for 2019. Is that something that needs to happen annually, or are we good to go to continue to partner with them? And what can we do to continue to raise awareness into the community that we all have a responsibility to uh, limit our crashes. And then just one one other thing. Thank you very, very much for one, um, the high, um, street, um, 9th Street, Hover to Airport Road. It's been completed, all the bike lanes and things. I do have a question. There are a couple of poles that are pretty tall and then they have um, our speed limit way up there on the top of that pole. And I'm, I'm just curious why it's like that. So that's what I have, but thank you. So I can speak to the, the, the recent fatals. Uh, yes, the one on, on 119, just east of County Line Road, which is the Latin, the entrance to Walmart and Sandstone Ranch that is in the city limits of Walmart. As a matter of fact, uh, the city limits extend a little bit further east there to Fairview and Sandstone uh, Ranch Road. The one on Oxford is just outside the city limits of Longmont. Uh, we did respond to assist on that, with, but that would be under the jurisdiction of the Colorado State Patrol. So that one will not be counted uh, in the Longmont fatality rate. Uh, so yes, for, for 2020, we have responded to and investigated two fatal crashes, which have resulted in three total fatalities for this year. Um, and just so that nobody uh, is confused by that, the one earlier this year in, in April involving the state patrol and the the pursuit that where the 16 year old was killed, that one will not be counted towards a fatal car crash based on the totality of the circumstances. And I can answer any clarifying questions on that one, if need be. And I'll let Tyler talk about the other, I can't remember the other question, I apologize, Sandra. Sure. So in terms of the partner agency with CDOT, we are, we signed, we signed, signed up with CDOT. We are a partner agency moving forward. It's not a one year annual deal. It is a commitment to CDOT. In terms of outreach, I think that's something where we, we can still do better and definitely open to, to feedback from this group and work from this group to help spread the word about safety. And I think we can also look at maybe working with our public outreach team for some other ideas on how to get some more information out. So that may not be all inclusive, but a couple of steps that we can take. Um, and your, your last question was about the taller posts that are still on 9th Avenue. The, 
the next thing coming on those is the permanent radar sign. So I think that was something that we committed to and we're looking to do as we went through the public process on that one. Speed was a common concern we heard of those residents. And so that was among the a handful of things we're doing to try and mitigate speeds. One of one of the solutions or changes we're making is adding those radar signs. So I believe they're in stock, they're being programmed. I don't know the installation date, but that's what those taller poles are for. Wonderful, thank you. Um, 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 yeah, with the talk of vision zero and um, maybe Phil's maybe follow this a little bit more, but um, Dr. Cog is also um, looking at doing some kind of larger regional vision zero implementation, if that's correct, Phil. I think Phil had to jump off. Oh, has he dropped yeah, off? Phil, Phil had to run. But um, yeah, so we might see something with that as well. Thank you. Great. Only thing I will add on my side is that um, I did see that there is a meeting tomorrow night for those who are interested. Um, Was it called Green Transportation in Boulder County Town Hall, uh, which seemed kind of interesting. Um, I saw a note from um, uh, from Claire Levy um, uh, about that. I, I guess it is an online town hall from five o'clock to six o'clock, and I'm happy to send out the the link to folks afterwards. Uh, for those that are interested, but uh, always interesting to hear how um, you know, different people are, are are viewing the changes in the transportation sector, especially as it relates to uh, kind of greening our transportation just a little bit more. So I will send a link out on that. Um, with that, let me turn it over to uh, Council Member Peck and, and see if there are any uh, uh, comments on your side. Thank you, Neil. Um, and I, I want to echo everyone else's uh, thank yous to the staff for that great report. It does take a lot of time to put together. Um, but some things that I consistently get uh, questions on are our street signs. It seems like um, they're hard to see. They're hard to see at night because they're in the end, they're not in the middle of the street. They're not lit. The light doesn't uh, shine actually on the street sign. And especially in the spring, some of them, especially on Francis Street, um, it seems like uh, the trees sometimes overgrow and block the sign. A lot of it's coming from new people who move here because they look to the signs to figure out where they are and where they have to go. Um, so are we looking at that at all, Tyler? Or is that pretty standard that we're using the same type of signs as the rest of the state or Boulder County? Councilmember Peck, a couple, a couple of things on that. One, we have um, we've had some changeover in our operations staff. Part of part of operations is maintaining the signs, and I, I personally notice a handful of them that are definitely faded out and in need of replacement. So that's on my to-do list is to um, get in touch with operations and the new staff that's there to really make sure we're doing a thorough inspection of all the signs, uh, merely making sure they're visible, one being retroreflectivity and two, placement for the trees. And in addition to the trees, I'm getting ready to hit send on this email for service works. If there are specific trees that are blocking signs, please report it on this link service works and we can have staff respond and trim trim tree limbs. Or I've even run into cases where maybe it's not just a minor tree trim, it would take serious cutting of the tree. So in cases like that, happy to look at, is there a better placement option for the sign rather than destroy a good tree? So. Couple of options on that, but I think one, the first step is really getting our, our inspection of the signs in good shape and make sure that we're replacing them as they're fading out. Um, in terms of lighting, there's no requirement that they're lighted. And I think when we look at lighting and the cost it would take to do that in terms of bringing an electric service that's consistently drawing power, um, I think that's going to end up probably being cost prohibitive and maybe not the direction to be best served for the city. As they're replaced, Tyler, is there any discussion about making them bigger, uh, larger, so they're easier to read? Or is that mm -hmm. not really works at all? Something we can talk about for sure. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you so much. 
Are, are there, I mentioned one transportation meeting that's coming up tomorrow. Any other transportation meetings that are on the radar that folks should know about? I think uh, Phil, Phil covered a couple of them and communications from staff before he jumped off of here. I don't have anything else to add to that. All right. Well, we have uh, some topics on the radar here, including neighborhood traffic mitigation and transportation uh, roadmap. Um, what, what is the transportation roadmap, just to remind uh, folks? So really the transportation roadmap is in conjunction with the sustainability plan and helping guide our meeting those sustainability goals. Got it. Sounds good. Well, we'll look forward to uh, those two topics and others moving forward. Any other last comments before we wrap up? Yeah, Courtney. I had a quick question for uh, just an opinion from Eric. Um, I used to live in Norway and their DUI rate is fairly low because one DUI and you lose your license for life. So the penalty is very severe. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, he has an opinion or if anybody's looked at, I mean, that's probably a state level, but is there any movement to make DUIs uh, penalties more severe and would that reduce the rate of DUI in his opinion? Uh, that's a great question, Courtney. Um, statistically speaking, uh, a lot of our DUI repeat offenders, so I'm not sure what uh, impact have on making the fines stiffer on them. Uh, you are correct that that would be a decision at the state level with the state legislature because it would have to be a change in the law. Um, but yes, I, I would agree with Tyler that I think we've seen a steady increase in DUI yeah, crash type since 13, well, 2014 after the passing of Amendment 64. Um, can't say for certain that has directly related to marijuana usage, but a lot of times for our substance abusers, if you will, they are poly use, which means they do different types of drugs. So not only marijuana, but other drugs and alcohol. So uh, it's possible right now for a first offense, uh, you're looking at a uh, three month to one year revocation on your driver's license. Subsequent offenses could equal jail and a longer revocation on the driver's licenses. And I think- Thank you very much. Timed out. Thank you. I don't know if you, if you guys got that by my screen time. Yep, we got it. Awesome. Well, with that, we will uh, plan on reconvening coming up on uh, November, what is it, November 9th. Um, hopefully by then we'll know the results of our election. We'll find out soon enough. Uh, until then, I really appreciate everyone's time there, and special thanks to staff for being able to put together such helpful data. We'll consider the meeting adjourned. Talk to you guys soon. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thanks, you guys. Thank you.